have some more. Okay, so again, I'm gonna go ahead and start. Three separate sections, Dr. King's pro-Israel legacy, and then on to Israel's multi-ethnic society, and then lastly, to BDS, um, particularly with that one. So, <clears throat> it will be about three years from now, and Dr. King's assassination would have been 50 years ago. We have some of his most staunch pro-Israel statements literally 10 days before he was assassinated. And I'm, it's that particular statement that I want to share with you here today. Now, obviously, his stance with Israel, two things. Number one, he was not pro-Israel and anti-Arab, which we'll talk about that in a moment, because it is possible to be pro-Israel and pro-Arab. He was. He embodied it. And I'll show you what I mean by that. But then secondly, what I need to let you know is that even though there's a much more of a body of work of Dr. King's going on record in support of the only democracy in the Middle East, we're focusing on this one first for time concerns, but also because of the breadth of what he said. Okay. So on March 26, 1968, Dr. King was the honored guest of the 68th Annual Convention of the Rabbinical Assembly. And at that assembly, they had a question and answer period. And questions had been pre-submitted. Rabbi Gendler was the rabbi actually reading the questions. They didn't necessarily come from him. And one of the questions at some point was this one. I've truncated it because they were long. We have transcripts. If you don't have access to it, you can go on our website, uh, ipsi.org, ipsi-now, ibsi-now.org. Or you can email us as well, and we can just send you a link to the actual transcript. They have the entire conversation. They talked about foreign policy, the Middle East, domestic policy, the upcoming election, all of those things. So the question here, for our purposes tonight, Rabbi says to him, <clears throat> Dr. King, what would you say if you were talking to a Negro intellectual, an editor of a national magazine, and were told, as I have been, <clears throat> that he supported the Arabs against Israel because color is all important in this world? In the editor's opinion, the Arabs are colored Asians, and the Israelis are white Europeans. What would you point out that more than half of the Israelis are Asian Jews with the same pigmentation as Arabs? Or would you suggest that an American Negro should not form judgments on the basis of color? What seems to you an appropriate or an effective response? Dr. King, again, his response to a longer question was longer than we have time for today. We're going to look at three aspects of his response. The first of those three is race or ethnicity. His first response was to the question of, people of color siding with the Arabs in the Arab-Israeli conflict on the basis of color. The first thing that Dr. King says was, on the Middle East crisis, we have had various responses. The response of some of the so-called young militants, again, does not represent the position of the vast majority of Negroes. There are some who are color consumed, and they see a kind of mystique in being colored. And anything non-colored is condemned. We do not follow that course in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and certainly most of the organizations in the civil rights movement do not follow that course. We will revisit race and ethnicity in a few moments. He went on to the second portion of his response. I think it is necessary, Dr. King said, <clears throat> to say that what is basic and what is needed in the Middle East is peace. Peace for Israel is one thing. Peace for the Arab side of that world is another thing. Peace for Israel means security, and we must stand with all of our might to protect its right to exist, its territorial integrity. I see Israel, and never mind saying it, as one of the great outposts of democracy in the world and a marvelous example of what can be done, how desert land almost can be transformed into an oasis of brotherhood and democracy. Peace for Israel means security, and that security must be a reality. End statement. His very next statement, with no breaks or edits, was this. The, last, the third portion of his response. On the other hand, we must see what peace means for the Arabs in a real sense of security on another level. Peace for the Arabs means the kind of economic security that they so desperately need. These nations, as you know, are part of that third world of hunger, of disease, of illiteracy. I think that as long as these conditions exist, there will be tensions. There will be the endless quest to find scapegoats. So there is a need for a Marshall Plan, and that is highlighted on for a purpose. We'll come back to that as well. For the Middle East, 
where we lift those who are at the bottom of the economic ladder and bring them into the mainstream of economic security. That's the three sections that Dr. King responded to. Race and ethnicity, which we'll return to in a moment. <clears throat> the Israelis in terms of peace and security. And then lastly, the Arabs. For those of you who might not be aware, he's not using the term Palestinians because Palestinians was not a term that was used even as late as the 1960s. It was much more of a modern term. I'm not saying that it's not a real term. I'm saying it wasn't a common term at that time. So when he says Arab, think Palestinian because that's why he's saying Arab. Just like he's saying Negro because that's how you refer to black people in the 1960s, just so we have the terminology correct. The third thing I would point out too is this. March 26, 1968 was not only 10 days before he was assassinated, it was almost a full year after what's called in Israel the Six-Day War, the 1967 war. For those of you who aren't familiar with that, the Six-Day War, the 1967 war, was a war in which Israel preemptively struck Egypt, Jordan, and Syria because an attack was pending. And after having won that war, controlled Judea and Samaria, commonly referred to as the West Bank, the Golan Heights, Gaza, and the entire Sinai Desert. Now, Dr. King did not weigh, on that, weigh in on that specifically. The only reason I point out in terms of the timing is that he made these statements about Israel's peace and security months, nine months after that war. So he never called Israel a occupying or colonizing power. He basically said about Israel, security, and then he moved to the Arab people. <clears throat> One of the reasons why we start with this in our presentation is because by now, Dr. King's words, his image, his other speeches, are so used for so many different purposes, especially human rights, and rightly so. He is an icon, almost like a deified figure for better or for worse. He represents justice. He represents the quest for justice. Unfortunately, there are also those who are fairly anti-Israel. And what I mean by that, I'm not talking about those who are critical of a government and what some of its policies. I'm talking about for those anti, for me, in the purposes of this discussion, anti means not 1967 borders, 1947 borders. Anti-Israel in the sense of Israel should not be there. The Jewish people should not be there. Uh, Dr. King was nowhere near that. Dr. King was a defender of the Jewish state. Unfortunately, there are some of an anti-Israel camp who use his visage, visage or use his words the opposite of what he intended where Israel is concerned particularly. And they do that in two ways. They either try to, one, revise history, as I just shared with you, or two, amend his views and say things like, yes, but if he were here today, he would not be pro-Israel. First of all, he's not here today, so none of us can say definitively what he would or would not say. But what we do have on record are his own words and 10 days before he was assassinated. The last portion of this part in terms of his, uh, 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 his legacy, if you will, this picture that you see in front of you is a group of some of the who's who of the civil rights movement. To the far right is Ralph Abernathy, obviously next to him in the middle is Dr. King and Coretta Scott King, if you can see the picture there. To the far left are two gentlemen who started an organization in 1975 called BASIC, Black Americans to Support Israel Committee. The one on the far left is Bayard Rustin. He was one of Dr. King's main coaches in the nonviolent protests against injustice. And the one next to him is A. Philip Randolph. He established the A. Philip Randolph Institute after Dr. King had passed away. And these two men were very, very close associates of his. The Black Americans to Support Israel Committee was formed specifically around the time in which the UN was considering passage of UN Resolution 3379, Zionism, Zionism is Racism. These black Americans, these civil rights leaders, galvanized support within the African American community to come against that resolution that was going through that actually, if you know, did pass. It was rescinded in 1991. And it not only called Zionism racism in doing so, it condemned the entire homeland movement of the Jewish people because of the coercion that was going on. It was such a travesty that was being talked about by Rustin and A. Philip Randolph and many others uh, they campaigned within the UN to stop that resolution from being passed. Though they were unsuccessful, the legacy had continued on from what Dr. King had started with these gentlemen. I'm sorry. I was 
pausing. I didn't know I was pausing for a dramatic effect. <laughs> Which moves us to this next portion here. Dr. King went on record as standing in defense of the Jewish state and also in very much concern, and if you want to use that word, in solidarity with the Arab people. He was never dismissive of their plight and what had happened in terms of all the controversy, the wars, and all those other types of things, which we don't have time to get in on, to, on tonight. So and in discussing Israel as a society now, I want to harken back to the actual question that Rabbi Gendler asked him. And I have it on the screen here again. And I'm going to read it as we're kind of observing what the rabbi is actually saying. Dr. King, he says, <clears throat> What would you say if you were talking to a Negro intellectual, an editor of a national magazine, and were told, as I have been, that he supported the Arabs against Israel because color is all important in this world? In the editor's opinion, the Arabs are colored Asians and the Israelis are white Europeans. Would you point out that more than half of the Israelis are Asian Jews with the same pigmentation as Arabs? Or would you suggest that an American Negro should not form judgments on the basis of color? Dr. King did not address the multi-ethnic diversity of Israel. He simply moved to the race issue on the table which was that there are some who see a mystique in being colored, he said, and anything non-colored is condemned. Dr. King wasn't saying that there were not Jews that were black, white, and brown. He was addressing what he, addressing what he called the militant movement, which was a smaller movement within the broader civil rights movement. That movement was so militant, not that militant is a bad thing. Dr. King even said himself, sometimes militancy is good. But the militant movement was so strong, they were speaking in very disrespectful terms, even to Dr. King himself. They called him names that I won't repeat here right now. And they had totally dismissed all that he had already done because they felt that he was too, I can quote one thing, close to whitey. His stance with Israel garnered him a great deal of flack and some from his own community. Israel is a multi-ethnic, diverse society. And so the attack against Israel by its enemies, one of the things that we do with the Israel Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel, we explain to people, particularly if they are of the mindset that Israel is somehow a European colonizing imperialist power. That was a lie when it started in the 50s, but it has only grown, and we'll talk about that some more. So when Hamas is lobbing rockets into Israel, they're not aiming for, quote unquote, white people. They're aiming for Jews, regardless to what color they are, because rockets are indiscriminate. This picture that you see here are of Ethiopian Jews in a bomb shelter around 2012 in the southern part of Israel because rockets are being lobbed into where they are from Gaza. Because again, Hamas could care less what ethnicity the Jews are. They don't care if they're from Ethiopia or from Yemen or from Sudan or from Iraq, Iran, Australia, Austria, Germany. It's the Jewish people, which is why BDS is racism at its core. It's Israel hatred. The gentleman behind me, some of you know. Can I respond to that? Not yet, sir. You, you can in a moment. I'm going to represent, and then my friend Kalev is going to present, and we definitely want to hear what you have to say, absolutely, and all of your questions as well. So I'm going to get out of your way real quick. And, I, and as a matter of fact, Mati, if you're in the room, I didn't pass out papers or anything, so if they have those, yeah, okay. But please hold it. Any, anyone else as well, we want you. I'm, I'm going to talk and move. I'm going to talk and move, talk and move. Get out of the way. So the gentleman that you see on the screen there, if you don't know him already, is Omar Baguti. He is one of the um, founders, if you will, of the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement. Why is that connected to race? Well, that was pilfered from the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement that was successful against the South African apartheid government, which is an apartheid government, which was a neo-Nazi party, which Israel is not. Is it a perfect government? No. 
All the ducks in a row? No. But there is not a perfect government on the earth, and Israel is about as far removed from apartheid as you could be. Omar Baguti, who is boycotting Israel, you may know, got his master's degree from Tel Aviv University and is now getting his doctorate degree from Tel Aviv University. So how are you going to boycott? I'm sorry, let me keep going. So now, <clears throat> what we do in our organization is let people know and put a face to BDS. This is some of what our organization does. The BDS is race hatred. It's not about negotiation and talking and coming to understanding. It's about minimalizing. It's about diminishing. It's about dismissing the Jewish state. So who's hurt by BDS? Israelis are hurt by BDS. The Jewish people. The gentleman that you see here, you may not know, I have a little caption under there. Use it as an example is Mr. Ben Phillips. Ben Phillips, as an example, is the director of policy for Oxfam, which is a human rights organization. You may have, some of you, if you've been on, in terms of the current events, you may have seen that there's a big brouhaha in the news that had to do with Scarlett Johansson and SodaStream, which is an Israeli company. And Oxfam, Scarlett Johansson, the lovely young lady to the left of uh, Ben Phillips there, she was a spokesperson, both for Oxfam, and also for SodaStream, the Israeli company. Oxfam, as, long as, as well as other organizations, wanted a boycott of SodaStream, the company, because one of its factories operates in the disputed territories. Now, that factory employs some 1,300 people. Of those 1,300, some 500 of them are Palestinians who are receiving Israeli wages and Israeli benefits. They have gone on record, the Palestinians working there, that they do not want their factory boycotted. They want to continue to work for SodaStream. As a matter of fact, on my way here, uh, the Presbyterian Church of the United States of America had done a visit. It's not an official thing, but there are members of the organization that were previously boycotting SodaStream. They went and actually visited the factory. And then they said they changed their minds because they went through the factory and talked to the people who worked there. Ben Phillips wants SodaStream to shut down the factory. So now let's have a last conversation, because Israel is often, con like I told you, accused of being an imperialist, Western European, dominant society, don't care about people of color. Check this out. This gentleman here wants the factory closed and 500 Palestinians thrown out into the unemployment line while he is otherwise gainfully employed in his office, where this is in London, New York, where it was supposed to be. He wants the factory closed, even though the employees don't want the factory closed. That's called elitism. That's called dominant society thinking. Why? Because if I'm sitting in my office and closing the factory, but I go home at the end of the day and I can feed my family, the factory closes no skin off my nose. And the hypocrisy of it, it's what's so maddening. That means if Oxfam had its way, there'd be a lot of people without jobs. Does this settle the, the land conflict? No, of course not. And SodaStream doesn't even uh, pretend as if it's trying to settle the conflict. It's about jobs, wages, benefits. Last part here. Last year, uh, uh, Abu Mazen, or Mahmoud Abbas went on record as saying, no, we don't want Israeli goods boycotted. We do business with. Now, I know he said things to contradict himself here and there, but what's amazing, my friend Kalev is going to come up in a moment, is that there is a connected relationship that's there. I'm going to try your attention to one last thing. When I shared with you this last part, when Dr. King had made the statement about what peace for the Arabs meant, and I highlighted one of those terms which said Marshall Plan. Yeah. He says there needs to be a type of Marshall Plan whereby we lift the Palestinians, although he said the Arabs, out of this world of poverty and illiteracy, he says. Well, my friend is going to talk about that in this moment, but what we understand is that though it may not have been intentional, the Palestinian Authority, over the last 19 years, has received the equivalent of 25 Marshall Plans. Just the other day in the national papers, international papers, 
The European Union wants the Palestinian Authority to give an account of some $3.1 billion. Why do I bring that up with Dr. King? Dr. King advocated for largesse within the Palestinian territories for the people. So in talking about what he may or may not say if he were here, he might want to know where the money is. And in terms of Palestinian and human rights throughout the region, he might want to give an account, someone to give an account of things that are going on other than just with the Israeli government. Would he call the Israeli government to ask? No doubt, Dr. King was the person who spoke truth to power, but truth to all the power, not just selective parts of the power. And I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>